This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. everybody. Welcome tonight. Um, our talk today is on pelvic floor health beyond Kegels. Um, tonight, um, as you probably know, I, my name is Jeanette Lager. I am one of the OBGYN faculty. And then I have two of our wonderful physical therapists, Bevan Daniels and Nikita Shaw, that are also going to be talking about um, more detailed components of pelvic floor and pelvic floor health. None, none of us have disclosures related to the talk. And so in this talk, our plan is to review anatomy to sort of set a foundation for the conversation about pelvic floor health. We're going to define key terms in reference to the pelvic floor. We're going to discuss the initial approach to evaluation from an OBGYN perspective, and then go into deeper detail from a physical therapy perspective. So the skeletal system is the foundation of the pelvis. It's incorporated of several bones the hip bones, which include the ilium, the ischium, the pubis, sacrum, and coccyx. So let me just, so this whole area here, this, the component on this side is the ilium. The ischium is down here. The pubis is here, and there's a ligament that connects the two together, the pubis symphysis. And then the tailbone is often known as the coccyx, and then the sacrum is here. The ligaments are, if you think of the skeletal system as the bricks, the, the ligaments are kind of the mortar that hold everything together. And there are many, many ligaments, as you can see, that connect all of the, air, this, the bones of the pelvis together. The next layer is the pelvic muscles, and that's the area that we're really focusing on tonight. And so we'll be looking at this from a few different perspectives. A few of the muscles that are important co that compose the pelvic floor is the obturator internus, which is here on the side. And this is a sagittal cut, so it's looking at a person standing from the side. So you can see back here is the sacrum and the tailbone. And then this is the front, where the bladder would be right about here. So the obturator internus is off to the side. There's a whole group of muscles called the levators that are right here. There's a muscle that is back towards the, the spine, which is called the piriformis. And here you can see it in a different perspective, where if you look from the top, this is the urethra, or the entry to where the bladder is. The vagina is just below it. And then the rectum is behind that. And here again, we see these are the levator muscles. The obturator is off to the side here. And here's the piriformis in the back, <coughs> right near where the sacrum would be. Now we're looking from the perspective of going from the vulva deeper. So when you're looking from that perspective, the vagina is here, urethra or entry to the bladder is right here, and um, the muscles that are most involved with um, entry to the vagina include the superficial transverse perineal, and there's a deeper muscle behind that. And then the bulbocavernosus is the muscle that is that encircles right around the enteritis. And the enteritis is the entry to the vagina. So anytime we're talking about the pelvis, it's really important to talk about the abdominal muscles as well, because they're intimately involved with the pelvic floor. And you'll hear even more about that as we talk later with the, um, with the physical therapist. And 
the, when we start from the outside, everyone is usually familiar with the rectus abdominis, which are the central muscles. The connection here is the linea alba, which becomes darker in pregnancy and is often called the linea nigra during that time. The muscles on the side, there are two oblique muscles. There are the external obliques and the internal obliques. And one of the best ways to remember the external is because since they're on the outside, of your body, they're like, they point down like pockets into your pants, and then the internal obliques go the opposite direction. They angle up. So here's the external that are, it's cut here so you can see a portion of them. Underneath you can see the internal obliques, and then the deeper muscle below that is the transversus abdominis. So as we go deeper into the abdomen, then we can look down at the pelvis. So this is a perspective looking from the top into the pelvis. This is a laparoscopic image from surgery, and then this is um, Dr. Netter's drawing of it. So you can see here, this is the uterus. The bladder is right above it, but it's collapsed because um, the patient has a Foley catheter, so it's harder to visualize. These are the fallopian tubes that are coming down through the back. Ovaries are the white area just behind there. And then there are many ligaments that help to hold up and suspend the uterus. The ones at the top are the round ligaments that are right here. And then there are more ligaments that basically follow right along the sides of the uterus down to the base. The image that Netter has shows the bladder here just right in front of the uterus. You can see ovaries, fallopian tubes again are here. The round ligament, the support for the uterus is just right there. And the, I think one of the nice things about this image is that it also shows that there are many other organs that are in the area of where the pelvis is. So there's the uterus, the bladder, there's also the intestines. And so when we're thinking about pelvic pain, we always think about all of the other reasons that people could have pelvic pain. So pelvic floor dysfunction refers to a wide range of issues that occur when the muscles are either too weak or too tight or there's an impairment of the sacroiliac joint, lower back, coccyx, or hip joints. When you think about pelvic support, the muscles and ligaments function similar to a bridge. So you can kind of think of a bridge and a cable system that sits just underneath the bladder neck. So this is very similar to that. And that cable system is composed of the ligaments and the muscles that are sitting just right underneath the bladder neck and in the pelvic floor. When they're working well, everybody's happy. These pictures are from opening day from the Golden Gate Bridge. But when it's not functioning well, then that's when it can lead to other issues like incontinence. So there are two different types of incontinence. Um, the first is urge incontinence. Urge incontinence will sometimes describe as key in the go key in the door incontinence, because what happens is the patient will describe that as they're walking to go to the bathroom, they leak. So they're rushing to get home, they get out of the car, they put the key in the door, they're about to get to the bathroom, and then that's when they leak. And usually what happens is um, that the muscle that's around the bladder contracts abnormally. So it's a detrusor muscle contraction that causes that leakage. With stress incontinence, that's the incontinence that patients will often describe as um, It'll happen when they cough, sneeze, or laugh, when they're jumping on the trampoline with their kids or grandkids, when they're chasing after someone. Um, those are the times when they'll notice that they'll have a leakage. And that's usually in due to intra-abdominal pressure. And then there's also mix, which can be a combination of both. Chronic pelvic pain is described as pain that's below the umbilicus or below the belly button that lasts for more than six months. And it's different from acute pain because usually it'll have a, a slower onset. It is possible that you can have acute pain that is the, init the initial part of the pain that's followed then by a chronic pain. Sometimes patients can have chronic pain and then have a, an acute episode where it does worsen. But in general, when we think of chronic pain, we think of more longer, lo a longer duration of pain. There are many causes of pelvic pain. Um, recall all the muscles, ligaments, and organs that are in the pelvis. So it can be a combination of one of these. It can be a combination of all of them. So it, it can vary, and that's why it's important for us to take a very careful history when we're thinking about pelvic pain. 
When we think about GYN causes, you can look at it from um, a timing standpoint. So cyclic pain can often be times that occur with the, with the cycle. So middle schmerz is actually pain with ovulation. Dysmenorrhea is pain during their periods. Endometriosis initially is usually pain during the periods alone, but it can become more of a chronic pain where it occurs all the time. Adenomyosis tends to be pain that's associated with um, the periods, but can also progress. And a hemorrhagic corpus luteum cyst is usually associated with after ovulation. Sometimes there's a persistent cyst that has a small amount of blood in it, and that can be irritating and painful as well. The non-cyclic causes include pelvic adhesions, which can sometimes happen after surgery. Endometriosis, again, it can progress, and that's usually when the endometrial glands are outside of the uterus. Adenomyosis, which is when the middle part of the endometrial glands invade into the myometrium and cause heavier cramping and bleeding. Vulvodynia is pain that's associated on the outside of the vulva, outside of the vagina. And then vulvar vestibulitis, which is um, similar to that. It's a pain that's located in the most middle part near the entry to the vagina. So when we take a history that's targeted towards pelvic pain and towards incontinence, it's important first when we think about the pain component to characterize the pain, whether it's sharp, stabbing, dull, um, what the onset of it is, if there's any inciting events. So sometimes patients will have pain from standing for long periods of time. They might have it that's associated to diet or certain foods. And then any associated symptoms, so constipation, bladder pain. Um, so just seeing if there's anything else that might cause it or worsen it. For incontinence, we include all of those as well as thinking about whether patients have pain associated with incontinence, which can be associated with urinary tract infections urinating at night or nocturia. And then it's also important to look at the diet and fluid intake since there are certain foods and drinks that can be irritative to the bladder and worsen symptoms. We review the medical history, surgical history, and then for chronic pelvic pain, it's always important to ask about history of abuse or um, domestic violence since there is an increased incidence of that associated with chronic pelvic pain. I think one of the keys to an exam for pelvic pain is to make sure that we have good communication with the patient, um, know their history, their experiences with previous exams. Um, start with an abdominal exam, and there's one sign that's called carnets, and what that is is that when we're doing the abdominal exam and palpating, have the patient flex or do a, a small sit-up. And if the pain increases with a small sit-up, then that's a sign that it's probably associated with the muscles of the abdomen. We call, call that a positive Carnet sign. If the pain tends to decrease, then we think that it might um, be splinting, so protecting the internal organs, and that it may be more related to an internal organ reason for the pain. Um, we do a careful exam of the vulva. And when doing the exam for the vulva, it, it includes looking for postmenopausal changes, any signs of infection, any cysts that are seen. And we often will do a cotton swab test, which is taking just a small cotton swab and doing a very careful exam to try and identify if there's any areas in particular that are painful. Um, and then I had mentioned before vulvar vestibulitis, and that's when a patient has increased pain, especially in the area just inferior to the entry to the vagina. And it can be very helpful to use a cotton swab to just have a very um, specific exam of where the pain's located. Next is a pelvic floor exam. And this is a little bit different than the normal bimanual exam. Uh, generally, it's a single finger digital exam. And it's to check the muscles and see if there's any areas that cause particular pain, to see if there's any signs of prolapse or weakness with the muscles. So again, this muscle here is um, the bulbocavernosis. And here's the transverse perineal that we looked at earlier. So the first initial check would be to check those two muscles, see if there's any tenderness, and also check for muscle control. So I'll often have the patient tighten those muscles and then relax them. And then when we think about Kegels, then that's deeper. That's where the levators are located, which are just behind that. So with the single figure digital exam, starting with the bulbocavernosis transverse perineal muscles, and then going a small amount deeper to feel the the levators. They're at approximately 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. And then previously I showed that picture of the obturator muscle, which we can also palpate that's a little bit higher on both sides. And then behind that is the piriformis muscle. 
which is just right behind the levator muscles. And so with a single digit exam, then we can really try to localize where exactly the pain is. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll have patients contract muscles, either push their knee out against my hand to see if when that muscle is contracted, if it causes increased pain as well. And all of that provides us information as to whether the pain may be related to pelvic floor or if it could be something that's deeper or different from that. <coughs> then we do a usual GYN exam, which includes visualizing the cervix, doing a bimanual exam to feel the uterus, see if it may be another cause, either fibroids or an ovarian cyst or something else that could be contributing. And also to feel if there's um, pain with movement of the cervix, which suggests that it could be related to an infection. There's a very detailed exam um, to look at prolapse, which is called the POP-Q. And all of the, the points that are listed here are all components of the POP-Q. And it's basically a test to measure how much these tissues move down and the organs, like the uterus, move down with fall solver when somebody pushes down as if they were having a bowel movement. <clears throat> There are lots of additional tests that we might consider doing. So if, it's, if, there, if it, the symptoms are suggestive of a urinary tract infection, then we'll often get a urinalysis or urine culture. If it seems like it might be related to the GYN organs, then we would get a pelvic ultrasound. If it may be suggestive of um, endometriosis, sometimes we'll do a laparoscopy. But today we're focusing mainly on the pelvic floor etiologies. Um, so, Excuse me. yes. What does etiology mean? Etiology means causes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so the reasons that I refer patients to physical therapy is if I find musculoskeletal findings um, for chronic pelvic pain, if when we check for Kegel muscle training, so I'll often have um, the patient contract to see if they can identify where their muscles are to be able to practice Kegels at home. And so if they're, they have difficulty isolating those muscles, then I'll refer them to physical therapy. And then also, if they do note that they have incontinence, either stress or urge, I'll often send them for either an initial evaluation, if we're using multiple treatments to treat the issue, or to start with conservative treatments first. And I will hand it off to Nikita. Um, all right. So. This is where physical therapy usually enters the story, and uh, we rely on our fantastic ob guides to um, do a thorough exam so we know that they've ruled out certain causes, and they've perhaps ruled in musculoskeletal causes, and that's why they're coming to us. So the reasons physical therapy um, or physical therapists are in this realm is because there's muscles down there, now you know, just like everywhere else. Um, and that's how we uh, became the experts in um, helping treat uh, musculoskeletal impairments of the pelvic floor, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna do today is talk a little bit about uh, incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse um, and how we assess uh, and treat these. And we're gonna go a little bit beyond Kegels, which is perhaps what um, most of you have heard of. Um, and then what Bevan, uh, my colleague, is going to talk about is a little, uh, delve a little bit deeper into the pelvic pain aspect of things. So we talk about this pelvic floor, right, all the time. And basically the reason why we're using this to our advantage um, is because it does all of the functions that are listed there. So it's supportive, right? So it holds all these organs up. It stabilizes the entire pelvis, right? So you can see how it's attached to the sacrum there. Um, and so uh, it helps stabilize the pelvis as an entirety. Um, it, it helps in sphincteric function. So obviously, because of where it lies, it really does affect bowel and bladder function. Um, and then sexual function, which is what we all know, of course. Um, so the basics are that Okay, either we're dealing with underactive muscles, right? So they're not working that well, they're loose, we need to get them stronger. And those are the people that typically ha have problems with incontinence or what we, what we call pelvic organ prolapse. Or there's the overactive muscle group, right? So they're too tight. And that typically is associated with the pelvic pain um, and difficulty voiding kind of diagnoses. Now, that's the basics. That's, okay, this makes sense. This is, I got this, right? Easy to treat. However, what the beyond really is, is that um, we see a little bit of, we'll see overactive muscles in incontinence. We'll see underactive muscles in pelvic pain. 
So it's a little bit more confusing. And you really do need to get evaluated in order to in order for someone to figure this out, right? Um, so uh, here's where I give my example of, um, so when someone comes in with stress urinary incontinence, so I pee when I laugh, I cough, I sneeze, right? So those people are really used to guarding because they want to hold on and they don't want to leak. So they actually have overactive muscles because they're both weak and tight at the same time. Okay, so they're weak overall, but then they've been doing this guarding, so they're tight as well. So it would seem bizarre to some people, but I will stretch the pelvic floor for people with incontinence, and that seems absurd, right? It seems like, what? I'm loose. Why are you stretching me? But the concept is that, imagine a bicep curl, right? So if I was doing a bicep curl, and I was doing Kegels all day, right? This is my pretend Kegel, so the pelvic floor. Um, it's not going to work effectively. Oh, I do my Kegels. They don't work. I'm still leaking, right? But the truth is that if I stretch it and get it back to its effective length, then I can go through the entire range of motion, the excursion, and then it's working effectively and the Kegels are actually going to be useful. So it would not be unusual for your pelvic floor therapist to stretch your pelvic floor if you have incontinence because there's reasoning behind it, right? Um, so I know Dr. Lager already covered this, um, but just to reiterate, so the stress incontinence is the coughing, laughing, sneezing, input, big abdominal in, um, pressure input, and then you leak, right? Urge incontinence, again, she talked about the key in the door. Um, other triggers can be sort of running water, or I go from cold to hot environments. Um, just any sort of strong urge that leads you to believe you've got to go now, and then you have a loss of urine, right? and mixed, which is a lot of what we see actually, okay? So um, it's usually, I have a little bit of that, but yeah, I also have this urgency. And I also have that a little bit when I laugh. Yeah, but that's normal, right? So like most people think that it's normal. I've had children, I leak, right? But the truth is that we can have healthy pelvic floors and this is a huge quality of life issue that we see all the time and we can treat, okay? So speak up as part of the, um, the uh, thing, the, what we wanna convey today. Um, so we looked a little bit at prevalence of incontinence, and this was just one study, um, and there were 25% of women that were identified with this problem. 12% um, of women that were under 30, so we're looking at the people that perhaps have had children before 30, uh, female athletes are prone to this because of the pressure that they put on the pelvic floor, um, and then 40% uh, above 90, so the elderly population menopause hits, sarcopenia, which is like basically a thinning out of the muscles, some atrophy, that can all contribute to um, making the problem a little bit more prevalent in the elderly. Um, and then pelvic organ prolapse, right? So we, we uh, alluded to it a little bit, um, but this slide is basically intended for you to um, understand um, that uh, when we talk about pelvic organ prolapse, we're basically talking about a loosening of the structural element, so then that organ is kind of hanging low, right? So we can have what's called a cystocele, which is on the bottom left there, um, and essentially the bladder is starting to collapse into that vaginal wall, okay? In the second picture, you can see a rectocele, so that means the rectum is starting to collapse into the vaginal wall. And in the third one, you can see a uterine prolapse, which is basically the uterine starts to hang down low. Okay? So prolapses can be both symptomatic and asymptomatic, meaning you could have one of these and not even know about it, doesn't give you any symptoms, that's fine, right? But you can have some symptoms as well. So the big things we hear, incontinence is one of the symptoms as a result of prolapse. Um, and two is the sort of feeling of heaviness, okay? So people describe like some, it feels like something's falling out of me. There's a little bit of heaviness in that sort of vaginal area, okay? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and again, Dr. Lager talked about um, the stages and they do a very thorough uh, pop Q exam. And what we do is a little bit different. Um, and it's called, um, it's, a, it's a staging um, system that we use where what I'll do with my patient is when I'm having, when they're lying down and I have my finger inserted vaginally, I'll sort of push down at the rectum and say, okay, go ahead and bear down. And then I'm looking at if it's hanging loose, you know, in the anterior vaginal wall. And then I'll do the same thing. I'll push up on on the anterior vaginal wall, and I'll say, okay, go ahead and bear down, and then I'm looking if, for if there's a rectocele, okay? And then I'll have them cough really hard, so I'm trying to look at where the uterus is in space. So it's kind of a quick and dirty, okay? Um, and then we stage it according to 
uh, where we see that organ hanging loose till, um, according to the hymen, et cetera. Um, I will say that typically the, the lower stages, the stage one and two, do better with conservative pelvic floor therapy. And the stage threes and fours, which are basically where the organ is perhaps hanging all the way down to the introitus or beyond, those do better more with sort of um, like a pessary, which is a bit, uh, like a tampon-like splint that can be inserted and it helps hold things up, um, or a surgical intervention. Um, so the assessment, right? So somebody comes in my door and um, Dr. Lager has referred them for uh, incontinence or pelvic pain or some such diagnosis that she thinks is musculoskeletal. Um, so usually in our evaluation, we go through a thorough subjective exam as well. So we'll ask you about you know, bladder, bowel, sexual function, because again, those are the things that the pelvic floor does, right? Uh, we wanna know fluid intake and how often you're going. What's going in, what's coming out, right? Um, we want to know your incontinence. What, wh when are you having your episodes? How often? How much? You know, we want to know because we want to set a baseline, and then we want to see how you're improving over time. Um, other questions might include: What kind of exercise do you do? You know, are you a marathon runner, um, or are you a more sedentary individual? Um, what are the demands that are placed on that pelvic floor, essentially? Um, past medical history, do you have surgical history? You know, do you have lung disease? Lung disease matters for the pelvic floor because if you have something like COPD, for example, you're coughing a lot, a lot of the time. So think of the intra-abdominal pressure that it's putting on the pelvic floor, okay? Um, Menopause-related questions, so is there dryness? Have you hit menopause? Do you have you know, pain with intercourse? Um, those kinds of uh, questions. History of your pregnancies, any complications? Uh, did you have an episiotomy? Did you have vaginal C-section? Was there any tearing, vacuum-assisted? You know, little things that help us clue into the health of your pelvic floor. Um, goals, right? So are you planning on running a marathon? Then I need to know what kind of pelvic floor strengthening I need to do, right? Um, or, you know what, I just want to play with my grandchild and not, uh, not leak my pants, right? So, so that's um, goal setting so that we know where we need to take you to. Um, and then we may give you questionnaires. Uh, this is a your general distress inventory, and um, it basically helps us record outcomes. So baseline progress in sort of how you did over time. Um, so the next piece is our objective exam. So um, being physical therapists, we want to see the sort of whole musculoskeletal picture. Um, and so we want to look at posture. Okay, so um, again, Dr. Lager talked about how abdominals uh, matter, and they, and they absolutely do. And we want to look at where the pelvis is in space. So is it symmetrical? Is it sort of malaligned? You know, um, is there a leg length discrepancy? What is your lower body strength like? Um, what, is your, what are your peripheral, peripheral nerves like? Um, and then we look at the external pelvic floor. So um, when I do the external pelvic floor exam, I want to um, feel along the inner thighs. Is there tenderness there? Feel along the lower abdominals. Feel along the, the top of the what we call the mons pubis. Um, external vulvar region, okay? So similar, okay? So there will be definitely um, some overlap. And then some things that are a little bit different. And then, um, so we look for, you know, trigger points, like I said, so abdominal wall, inner thighs, um, and then uh, intravaginally, we place one finger uh, intravaginally, and we go through all of the muscles in detail. We take a very, like a layered approach, and we go through the superficial muscles, so um, uh, this pelvic bowl, we have this little pelvic model, right? So as I'm looking, all of the pink stuff here is muscles, right? So when I insert, essentially, I have to swing my hand over all the way to get through all of those muscles, right? So that's what I'm looking at more in detail. Um, and then uh, stage of prolapse, which we talked about. And then this is just some of the stuff. Um, there may be other things depending on your particular case. Um, so treatment, right? So what do we do about all these things that you learned about? Um, and so what I wanted to illustrate uh, with this slide is sort of, you know, a laundry list of we do have things beyond Kegels, okay? And um, uh, I'm going to go into each of these on, on um, the following slides. So we'll talk about a couple of these. So what I mentioned on the first um, uh, row there, though, is that uh, we train for pelvic floor contractions versus Kegels. And this can be confusing. So they're really the same thing. 
okay? But why I'm using the technical term is because when we do pelvic floor muscle training, we're really looking at technique. It's not, hey, you know what? You're leaking, do your Kegels. It's not just that, right? It's a lot more in-depth than that. Um, and so we're looking at, are you lifting through those muscles or are you just kind of clamping down at the introitus? Is it an effective pelvic muscle floor contraction? Coordination with the breathing, super important. We're both, both Bevan and I are gonna talk about that also a little further in um, and why the diaphragm and the pelvic floor should be working in conjunction. Okay, are you isolating those muscles or are you contracting in your glutes and in your inner thighs and everywhere else except right there? Okay, um, and then we're giving this as a dosed exercise. We're talking about positioning. So if you had prolapse, I might say, <clears throat> go ahead and do your pelvic floor contractions lying down or wedged up on something. Okay, so stick a pillow under your hips. So that way your organs are back and your pelvic floor actually has a chance to work versus you're standing and doing your pelvic floor contractions. Well, all those guys are hanging right onto the pelvic floor and then it's really got to try much harder, right? So we're talking through this sort of detailed approach when we are talking about Kegels. Um, and then equipment. So we have um, in our clinic uh, like electrical stimulation units. So we can place them, like we can place a little uh, device intravaginally or intrarectally, and it gives you a little electrical sensation and it helps sort of kick start the contraction. So if it feels like I got nothing, nada, then I want something to help assist in this contraction, right? Um, so we have those um, kind of extra devices that we can use as well. Um, and I pulled some research to show that this does work, right? So these are both Cochrane reviews, um, uh, which are good studies. And basically, they're showing that um, pelvic floor muscle training did work for stress urinary incontinence, urge urinary incontinence, and pelvic organ prolapse. Um, another little thing that I had on my treatment slide is something called biofeedback. So what is it? It's basically, again, one of the fancy little devices that we have, um, and it's a software that comes on the computer. We hook you up to the computer. We use little electrodes that we can place either intravaginally or perianally externally, okay? And then we place one, uh, I like to place it either on the abdominals or the glutes or anything that I think might be compensating, okay? So we have a compensatory little electrode, and then we have the main electrodes that are going to pick up your pelvic floor activity. And then we hook you up. And then we get to see these lovely graphs on the uh, software on the computer, and it's telling us, oh, okay, so you're squeezing now. Okay, you're relaxing now. Squeezing, relaxing. So it helps the patient get the visual feedback to say, oh, that's what I'm trying. Okay, I'm going to try to raise that graph up. Oh, okay, I'm not relaxing all the way. Wait, let me try something different. So it's a very useful sort of adjunct to our treatment to help us in training the pelvic floor. Okay? And um, for... The millennial and you, we now have home units, which come with smartphone apps that you can, you know, insert yourself. And then there's little games that you can play, et cetera, and do your own biofeedback at home, right? Another little treatment piece that I think is actually very important, okay, and something that you guys can just take home today if anybody's having this, uh, these kind of issues, um, is bladder irritants. So this is an educational piece that we uh, provide to our patients and, um, Basically, water is good for your bladder, okay? The water, the bladder lining feels happy when it's flushed with water, okay? But if you are having in excess any of these sort of bladder irritants, they can irritate your bladder lining and cause ab um, abnormal, essentially, urge signaling, right? So it's telling you you got to go when really you don't, right? So sometimes we find patients that we have them fill out a bladder diary and we figure out that Here's this individual who's having four cups of coffee a day and one cup of water. And that's something we can right away change, right? So let's add on some positive fluid. So let's add water to your diet, okay? And let's try to take out some of these bladder irritating things. Now, it's important that you, you think of these as something that is in excess in your diet. It doesn't mean stop eating tomatoes today, right? So, um, but this can be very helpful for a lot of patients to decrease their urge symptoms, Okay, And you want your bladder to not have concentrated urine that's irritating it. So don't dehydrate yourself. That's the other thing I teach my patients, that it's not, you know, if I drink more water, I'm going to leak more, right? It seems, the, it seems opposite or counterintuitive, but really, if you drink more water, you're going to get normal signaling. If you restrict yourself, you're going to get concentrated urine, irritating the liner, giving you more of those urge signals. 
So in the long run, water is still good. Um, the other educational piece, um, urge suppression techniques, right? So normal, what are normal bladder habits? We should be voiding every two to four hours and not at nighttime. Okay. So once you know normal, then you can identify abnormal. So if you have to go to the bathroom every half an hour, then that's probably abnormal signaling. My bladder certainly is probably, you know, is not full at this point. So we tell people to, if they're standing, sit down. So gravity plays a role. So that can decrease the urge. Applying pressure to the perineal area. So think about those people that, you know, also you cross your legs when you have to go really bad, right? Um, mental distraction techniques. They do work. So trying to distract yourself from the thought of the urge. Counting down from 100 by 7s. Or, you know, think of a favorite vacation place that perhaps doesn't have waterfalls and has more of a drier terrain. Um, performing Kegels. And I'm going to go into why Kegels help urgency as well. Um, walking slowly to the bathroom if you must go at the end. And then just remembering it's not an emergency, okay? So when we go through these techniques, we're really talking about sort of retraining the bladder, right? We're disciplining this badly behaved bladder. And it does take a little bit of time. It doesn't happen overnight. But this sort of timed, you know, approach of suppressing the urge and then thinking about when you're voiding does help retrain the bladder. And so I was going to talk about Kegels for urge and why, um, uh, why they affect uh, urgency is because your bladder and your pelvic floor on the bottom work antagonistically. Okay. So when your bladder squeezes, your pelvic floor relaxes so that you can urinate. So the opposite is also true. There's because there's this reflex loop, okay? And so when you squeeze your pelvic floor, your bladder can relax. It's giving a signal so the bladder say, hey, relax, I'm not ready yet. So doing those Kegels can help with your urgency symptoms. Um, another little sort of educational thing that we uh, give to our patients is, called, is what we call the knack. And basically it means squeezing before you sneeze, right? So when you can anticipate your sneeze, your cough, your laugh, try to squeeze those pelvic floor muscles so that you're kickstarting that involuntary contraction that's not working that well. It should work automatically, but it's not. So let's help it along. Let's kickstart it. And then that way you can decrease uh, the leakage episodes. Uh, another little um, piece is the toileting posture. Um, so what this uh, picture is showing, the one on the right shows in a seated posture, which is how we sit on a Western toilet, um, the puborectalis muscle acts like a sling and sort of does this choke hold to the bowel there, okay? In the squatting posture, you can see how this muscle, this sling, has relaxed, and it allows the bowel and this inner rectal angle to be changed such that voiding is easier. So recently, there's a, as a, there's a little device called, or a little stool called the Squatty Potty, okay, that's gaining some traction because basically what it does is helps you come into this squatting position when you're on a, on a Western toilet so that that anal rectal angle is changed and it can help with constipation, hemorrhoids, voiding difficulty. So such a simple little educational thing can make a difference. Um, the other thing that we address is the core and the pelvis and all the muscles around it, right? Um, so for example, there was a postpartum patient who came with, you know, abdominal. So sometimes uh, you can get a diastasis recti, which is a little bit of an abdominal separation postpartum. Um, and she also had incontinence. And this patient uh, had a significant diastasis, and we decided that it would be appropriate for us to give her a little binder, and then she would do the exercises at the, as at the same time. And the binder basically helped get her abdominals back to sort of where they belong, and her continence was resolved. So what we're trying to illustrate through that case is that there's this inner can system, okay, where what we call the core, the diaphragm on top, the multifidus, the multifid, ugh, can't talk, multifidus are your little back muscles, and then your um, abdominals along the front, and your pelvic floor on the bottom that make up this inner core and this inner can 
And this system needs to be working well. It's the internal pressure system in order for us to maintain continence, you know. And so the, the working of this system and the working of it well matters. And um, uh, for no normal pelvic floor function, we have uh, this diaphragm that lies on top of the pelvic floor and it automatically works out the pelvic floor when, it's, when the system is working the way it should. So I'm going to hand off the mic to Bevan, and she's going to dig deeper into this concept of why this matters um, in terms of normal pelvic floor functioning, and she has a great video that she'll show you, okay? And then we'll hold questions until the end. Okay. So this video is already running, but I'll explain it in just a moment. Before uh, focusing on pelvic floor dysfunction, I want to first explain normal pelvic floor function, and there are several components to this. One is the ability to do a strong contraction. The second is the ability to do a complete relaxation. And the third is good mobility of the pelvic floor in conjunction with the diaphragm. So this is what I want to illustrate with this video. So just to orient you, this is a sagittal view, a side view of a woman. On the, left, or on the right side is the spine. This red arrow is pointing to, on the bottom to the pelvic floor muscles, and then at the top to the diaphragm. So what you can see, if you look first here at the pelvic floor, it's moving up and down with breathing, and the diaphragm, of course, is moving up and down with breathing, and this is happening together as a unit. It's similar to the motion of a mechanical piston moving together. This piston analogy was developed by a pelvic physical therapist, Julie Weeb. So as we inhale, our diaphragm pushes down, our belly expands outward, and our pelvic floor descends. With exhalation, the opposite occurs. The pelvic floor and the diaphragm both lift up, and the belly flattens as our abdominals contract. So we're not meant to hold our belly tight all the time, nor our pelvic floor. And this video helps to illustrate why we use, bless you, diaphragmatic breathing when we're educating women on pelvic floor contractions and relaxation. Whereas Nikita spoke earlier about pelvic floor underactivity, which can lead to pelvic floor, or excuse me, to incontinence or prolapse, I'm gonna speak more about pelvic floor overactivity or hypertonicity or spasm, which all refer to the same issue. As Nikita pointed out, these issues can coexist, the underactivity and overactivity. In pelvic physical therapy, it's common for us to see women who present with a similar history. They have symptoms that seem to be consistent with a urinary tract infection. They have pelvic pain, they have urinary frequency, urgency, they have pain with uh, urination of a burning quality. However, when the lab tests are done, the culture is negative. If pelvic floor muscle spasm is found on manual exam, it's clear that these women have actually a muscular issue and they're sent to pelvic physical therapy. In this scenario, these women present with pelvic pain symptoms. They also have symptoms of urinary tract, uh, the urgency and frequency. They may also have pain with sexual intercourse and difficulty with voiding, all because of this pelvic floor muscle spasm. If the muscles around the urethra are held tight all the time, it can give a woman the sensation of needing to void throughout the day. And similarly, if she's not able to relax her pelvic floor, as is needed with voiding, she may have difficulty with bowel and bladder function. It's been shown that women with uh, vulvar pain compared to those without have increased resting pelvic floor muscle tone. They also have pelvic floor weakness and decreased ability to relax. So as Nikita pointed out earlier, we see women who have urinary incontinence as well as pelvic pain at the same time. And we address both of those issues. The rate of pelvic pain is reported as high as 28% and the rate of urinary frequency at 25%. A rather startling statistic is that almost 40% of women with chronic vulvar pain do not seek treatment. And hopefully this can change with education. So what are the causes of pelvic floor dysfunction in terms of hypertonicity? What causes the muscle to go into spasm? So as you can see, there are many causes. 
One is musculoskeletal, so either um, an injury like a fall on the buttocks or postural. So if a woman falls on her buttocks, the pelvis can be jarred out of alignment and the pelvic floor can uh, spasm as a result. If a woman stands with poor posture, uh, especially if done chronically, this can put strain on the pelvic floor. Childbirth is certainly traumatic to the pelvic floor as well as pregnancy. Stress or tension. Sometimes women end up developing pelvic floor spasm as a result of going through a very stressful event in their life. They may carry the tension from that event or period of time in their pelvic floor, similar to carrying tension in our uh, neck area and our jaw. Chronic holding. So for example, Nikita brought this uh, similar scenario up earlier. If a woman has leaking, she may hold her muscles tight all the time to prevent leaking and can end up with a problem of spasm as well. If uh, a woman is straining to, due to constipation on a regular basis, bearing down every day, that can put strain on the pelvic floor as well. So again, you can see there's a long list here of potential causes. Uh, this is an incomplete list of pelvic pain diagnoses that uh, we treat in physical therapy. I won't go into details, I just wanted to show you that there are multiple diagnoses that we treat. Nikita already went over the thorough uh, PT exam that we do, so I'm going to skip over that part and jump into treatment for pelvic pain. These are the different categories of treatment that we do in pelvic PT, uh, patient education, uh, exercise and posture. We do a lot of hands-on manual work and other treatments including biofeedback and uh, vaginal dilators. It's been shown that women with chronic pelvic pain have higher rates of constipation. Therefore, this is something we definitely address in PT. And Nikita already talked about this, how the angle um, at the hips, the squatting position, can result in a better align a positioning of the rectum and a looseness of the puborectalis muscle, which can facilitate voiding. So we, we certainly educate women about this, uh, putting a footstool or this specialized squatty potty that fits around the toilet um, can be very helpful. Uh, we educate women who have pelvic pain on self-vulvar care. So this includes, in terms of clothing, we recommend all cotton underwear. Some of the synthetic materials can be irritating to the skin. Uh, we recommend not wearing tight pantyhose or tight clothes that can be constrictive in that area. Uh, we recommend mild detergents. In terms of hygiene, unscented toilet paper, unscented soaps are recommended. Um, rinsing the vulvar area after urination. Uh, waiting, not waiting to void uh, until, excuse me, uh, urinating before the bladder is full, and preventing constipation with water and fiber intake. In terms of intercourse, we recommend a water-based lubricant that's glycerin-free. In the clinic, we use uh, a, a lubricant called Slippery Stuff. Um, we recommend ice after intercourse if there's pain, and that can be done externally or internally. And urinating and rinsing with cool water after intercourse can be helpful as well. In terms of physical activity, uh, we recommend avoiding long bike, uh, bike rides uh, because of that continual pressure on that perineum area. We also recommend avoiding highly chlorinated pools, which can irritate the skin, and avoiding prolonged sitting. And of course, we recommend this for everyone. Everyone should get up every 20 minutes as a general rule. Before I talk about other treatments, I want to touch on one other aspect of patient education, which is reassurance. Um, pelvic pain can be a, an isolating experience for some women. Uh, they may not talk about pelvic pain to their friends and family like they would talk about low back pain or an ankle injury. Um, and there is an emotional aspect to pelvic pain. So as providers, we can re reassure women that they're not alone, certainly in having this problem, and that there are many treatments available. When women present with pelvic floor muscle dysfunction and spasm, uh, we train the, muscles on train the muscles to relax. Uh, one of the techniques we use is diaphragmatic breathing. 
This is a helpful technique for general relaxation, uh, but it can also be particularly helpful for the pelvic floor. As we know with inhalation, the diaphragm lowers and the pelvic floor lowers at the same time. This stretching of the pelvic floor can be helpful for reducing tone and pain. We also teach women how uh, to assume certain stretching positions like the cat cow on the top and the child's pose on the bottom that can help facilitate relaxation. These are yoga positions. Um, we also teach women how to stretch the muscles of the lower extremity that attach to the pelvic bones. So that would include the inner thigh muscles, the hip flexors in the front, the gluteals, and the hamstrings. Whether a woman presents with incontinence or pelvic pain, one of our primary goals is achieving normal uh, strength of the pelvic floor, as well as normal relaxation. So strength training is always a part of our treatment plan. However, sometimes women present with marked spasm in these muscles, and they have pain with trying to do a contraction. So we may delay strength training in that scenario and focus solely on relaxation uh, initially. As soon as they can tolerate strength training, however, we'd incorporate that into their program. When we train pelvic floor muscles, we put equal emphasis on the contraction and the relaxation. So if we have a woman doing a five second contraction, we're gonna have her do a five second relaxation as well. And for some women who have a hard time relaxing, we may have her relax for 10 seconds before starting the next contraction. So this is a very important concept with pelvic floor strengthening. We coordinate the exercise with the diaphragmatic breathing, and in a moment I'll show you the video again to illustrate why we do that. Um, and we use biofeedback, so Nikita already explained this for, uh, in depth. Uh, this picture is showing uh, the actual machine that we use at the Mount Zion Clinic, the sensors we attach to the um, skin just adjacent to the rectal opening. Uh, on the top, you can see the graph with the green that's showing the pelvic floor muscle activity in microvolts. Uh, you can see the contraction, and then you can see the relaxation. So women can see how well they're able to relax. We can try different strategies to uh, improve their function. And sometimes we'll put the sensors on the skin and just work on baseline relaxation just at rest. We won't even work on the contractions necessarily. Okay, so here is the video again, just so you can see that the pelvic floor on the bottom is moving together with the diaphragm with breathing. So with inhalation, we'll instruct women to breathe in through their nose, let their belly expand, let the pelvic floor relax. As they exhale, blow out through your mouth and contract the pelvic floor. Imagine closing rectally and vaginally and imagine the muscles lifting up, similar to an elevator lifting up. So addressing uh, postural impairments and muscle imbalance at the spine and hips is another very important part of pelvic physical therapy. If we stand with incorrect posture, especially for a long period of time over many years, uh, this can apply strain and spasm at the pelvic floor. On the far left, uh, the woman is illustrating excessive anterior pelvic tilt. So this is uh, in like this position. So there's excessive lordosis in the lumbar spine. The hip flexors as a result become short. And this has been associated with pelvic pain. So to treat this, we would educate women on proper posture. We start at the feet, having equal weight at the front and the back of the feet, train how to find a neutral pelvic position, how to find the correct alignment of the spine, neck, and head. And then we would treat the impairments that have resulted, such as if there's tight hip flexors. Uh, this exercise on the right is an example of treatment. We also see women who have pelvic pain who have excessive posterior pelvic tilt of the pelvis, so where the buttocks is tucked under. And in this scenario, there's reduced lumbar lordosis. The hamstrings in the back of the thigh are tight. The gluteals and the pelvic floor are tight. Um, so for treatment, again, we train neutral alignment. And then we may um, also include a hamstring stretch uh, shown on the right. 
I'm now gonna focus and explain some of the hands-on or manual treatment that we do to treat pelvic pain. When we do these techniques, we're treating myofascial tissue. Myo is referring to the muscle and fascia is a type of connective tissue that surrounds the muscle. And fascia actually is, surround, is pervasive throughout our body. Uh, it covers every muscle in our body, our nerves, our organs, it's everywhere. Um, there is a superficial layer that's directly under the skin. So this is showing the skin and the hair. And then there's a deeper layer right on top of the muscle. And in the second picture, this white material here is the fascia, and the muscle is underneath. This is just showing the shoulder blade here. The fascia provides support to the tissue and allows for flexibility. With injury, however, um, adhesions can develop in the fascia. And one type of adhesion is called a trigger point. And a trigger point is a focal hyperirritable area in the fascia associated with taut bands of muscle fiber underneath. And when you press on a trigger point in a muscle, there's specific local pain, but there's also referred pain in a predictable pattern. So in this picture, this is showing the uh, trigger point pattern for the obturator internus. So Dr. Lager presented this earlier. It's the, um, one of the pelvic floor muscles on the side wall. And when a person has a trigger point here, they actually feel pain in the coccyx and then down the leg. So we may evaluate uh, a woman and she says, oh, that actually recreates my pain down my leg. So this would be a confirmation of a trigger point in that muscle. So to treat it, we would hold pressure in that area for about 90 seconds, and that can help release that uh, trigger point. And there's ways to do this yourself, and I'll go over that um, in a moment. And we do this treatment vaginally or rectally, depending on which muscle we're trying to target. We also treat myofascial restrictions at the lower abdominal wall, as well as the spine and hips. It's very typical for women who have pelvic pain to also have restrictions at the lower abdominal area, and particularly at the psoas, which is the, one of the hip flexors. And one of the treatments we use is uh, skin rolling. It's a very, um, it's a simple technique of basically just grabbing the tissue and rolling up along the, um, the belly area. And we do this in the clinic, and we also teach women to do this themselves. They can do it for five minutes, uh, once or twice a day. We also teach the colon massage. So the colon massage is literally uh, massaging over the large intestine, and this can help with constipation. So the technique is following the colon, so starting at the right side, making circular motions, going up to the rib cage, over and down. And a study found that uh, if performed about five times a week for about seven minutes, uh, this was effective at reducing constipation, reducing abdominal pain, and improving the frequency of bowel movements. To supplement what we do with our manual work, we will sometimes prescribe vaginal dilators. So you can see an example here of um, a dilator set. They come in about four sizes, usually in a kit of increasing size. And the smallest size is typically about the size of a finger. And this is used for vaginal or pelvic floor stretching. And some kits are, um, the material is a hard plastic and some is a more soft, flexible uh, silicone material. And one study found that if used for 10 to 15 minutes, three times a week, that helped improve women with pelvic pain who have pain during intercourse. The crystal wand is another self-stretching tool. It's shaped in this S shape, and it can be used to target some of the deeper uh, pelvic floor muscles for self-massage. So uh, I mentioned before the obturator muscle, obturator internus. And that's the muscle at the far lateral um, side wall here. So the crystal wand can be inserted vaginally and easily can uh, be moved to target that muscle. And it's been, the crystal wand has been shown to be helpful in conjunction with relaxation training and manual work by a PT. 
In terms of research uh, on pelvic uh, physical therapy, a lot of the studies are what we call multimodal, meaning they cover many different treatments at once. And this is what we do in the clinic, so this is very appropriate. Um, I'm highlighting two studies here, and they uh, basically had identical treatment plans. It was for eight weeks, uh, once a week with the physical therapist, and then they did home treatment on their own. So they did patient education, hands-on, the myofascial release techniques, uh, pelvic floor exercise. Um, they used biofeedback and electrical stimulation and dilator stretching. And there were successful results. In the Bergeron study, they found that 71% um, reported decreased pain, both with intercourse and with a pelvic exam, and increased frequency of intercourse. And in the 2010 study, they found decreased pain responsiveness in the pelvic floor muscles and at the vaginal opening, and decreased pain as well with penetration. So I want to end with the resources that are available here at UCSF. Uh, Wendy Katzman and Nikita and myself work at the Women's Health Center at Mount Zion, treating incontinence, uh, pelvic organ prolapse, as well as pelvic pain. And Nikita and I also work at the UCSF um, Orthopedic Institute uh, clinic, physical therapy clinic. Uh, we treat orthopedic diagnoses there, as well as women's health diagnoses. And this last resource is the American Physical Therapy Association uh, Pelvic PT Locator. So if someone in a different state needed to find or wanted to find a pelvic PT, they can uh, find it on this site. And the last thing I want to say is if you or someone you know, a family member or a friend, has one of these issues of incontinence or prolapse or pelvic pain, we encourage you to seek treatment. There are conservative treatments that are avail available that are helpful, and it's realistic at any age to have a normal and healthy pelvic floor. Yes. Uh, where do you start? Do you just go to UCSF Health Center first? Well, to, to be seen for physical therapy, we would, um, you would need to get a referral um, from your physician, usually from an OBGYN like Dr. Lager, um, and then once the referral is in the system, uh, the PT department would uh, contact. Would you go to a urologist or a gynecologist mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. start? Do you want to? I think, so you can either start with seeing your primary care doctor, you could see a urologist if it's related to urinary complaints. But yeah, so uh, so the question, just to go to repeat it, is um, who would you see first in order to see physical therapy? And so you could see your primary care doctor, but if the primary care doctor may not want to be as interested in ad addressing this or they don't feel as comfortable doing it, then you can always see a urologist or an OBGYN. Um, and so often what we'll do is just do the exam to see if it seems like it's musculoskeletal or if it's related to something else. And sometimes it can be both. For example, a patient could have sudden onset of pain that ends up that it, she has an ovarian cyst, but related to the, that ovarian cyst, she started to have more pelvic floor pain because of the tension related to that pain and then limiting her movement. She tenses up even more. And so on the exam, we might find that it's a combination of both. And so often what we'll do is we'll refer to physical therapy. They'll work on the muscles and then we can address the cyst at the same time or see if it resolves on its own. So we tend to do a lot of working hand in hand together where the patient will see physical therapy for a period of time. They'll come back and see one of their, the OBGYNs or they might see their urologist to see how their pain is doing. And if there's any anything that we might add with regards to incontinence or to pain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is, uh, floor, are the pelvic floor muscles just another one of those things that get weaker with age? Mm -hmm. So the question is, are pelvic floor muscles another one of those muscles that get weaker with age? I think actually you could answer that great. Um, so I think uh, sarcopenia, which is basically age-related changes to the muscle, does affect it. However, to Bevan's point, you could still have a healthy pelvic floor sort of at any age. So aging has some degree of, you know, something to do with it, but not necessarily, um, oh, you're aging, so you automatically have a weak pelvic floor, right? Yes. So the light super So the question is, um, as, a, as a light sleeper, um, getting up a couple times a night, is that normal to go to the bathroom? 
So in general, normal bladder habits, so I said nocturia, meaning nighttime voiding, is considered um, abnormal. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, again, fluid intake. So let's say you're having you know, a glass of wine before bed or you have two glasses of big glasses of water before bed. So I think that could be something that affects it. Um, I don't think that... Um, uh, in your case, like if, if there's something to explain it, right, then it's not terribly abnormal, like, oh my God, I've got to see my doctor right now because I wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. But I think it's, um, you have to sort of look at your bladder habits as a whole, and we want to restore as close to normal as we can. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so uh, the question is what that sometimes people will notice that when they sit down to void and then they stand up and they think that they've completed the void that they notice that there's a little bit of leakage and so um, the question is what's happening with that and I will say that one of the things that can happen is patients can sometimes have incomplete emptying and it can be partly because the the sphincter relaxing, the muscle contracting of the bladder isn't quite working perfectly. So oftentimes what I'll tell people to do is that they can do a double sit. So sit down, void, when you think you've completely voided, stand up, sit down again, and then usually you can finish your void. It also works well for urinary retention. So when somebody tries to go to the bathroom but they feel like they just can't get the urine out, to try to do the same thing. And it kind of communicates with the nerves to tell the bladder again, okay, it's time for the bladder muscle to contract and for the sphincter to relax. Um, so that can be one of the things that we recommend is to do a double sit. Um, do you wanna add anything more about kind of the components of that? Why someone might leak after? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, we're all discussing. Um, no, I was going to speak to the same thing. Basically, double voiding is a thing that we see for sure. There are people who are like, I get up, I feel like, yeah, I haven't quite finished, and then I go back. Um, and part of it is so sometimes in the Eurogyne testing, they'll look at like uh, urodynamic studies that will look at if there's any residual uh, urine left in the bladder. So. The patients that usually we see have come with that um, cleared saying, okay, fine, you know, this they're not having this uh, incomplete emptying of the bladder or they are having incomplete emptying of the bladder. And we still try to address the pelvic floor and see if there's any impairments there. We start to get it to work the way it should work in its coordination. And then we see how it affects, um, you know, that feeling of incomplete voiding essentially because ultimately it boils down to a difficulty with voiding and it still is addressed through the pelvic floor. Um, yes, in the back. Yes, so the question is, um, with regards to surgery for prolapse or surgeries for incontinence, how effective are those surgeries and do people ever need to come back for a repeat surgery? So most of the data looks at often a five-year follow-up to the procedures for both of those things. And so most of the time it's quite successful. I don't know the exact percentage, but I'd say around, let's say it's around 80%. After that time, then the effectiveness starts to decrease. And it can just be also related to the tissue getting a little bit weaker as well. Um, but it can be quite effective. And there are several different ways to address the different areas, the cystocele, so the prolapse from the front, prolapse from the back, or sometimes when the uterus comes down, apical prolapse. So there are many different types of surgery surgeries and depending on which component it is we may offer a different type of surgery for that and we have great urogynecologists that we work with as well and they focus on a lot of those surgical procedures yes all those pt cells are like a great thing is this the kind of thing that insurance companies actually reimburse for mm -hmm. yes. that's a that's a great question. So the question is, um, this is the physical therapy sounds great, but is it actually covered by insurance companies? I'll let you guys answer that. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
No, it is covered. It's um, it's uh, absolutely you know evidence based, research based. It's involving muscles. It's what physical therapists do, um, and it's uh, a, a known diagnosis code. So for all those reasons, it's covered. And the other thing I'd add is that's the the sort of the the process is that's why you see the doctor first and then they put in a referral for it and then most often it's covered and then the key is um, and Bevan kind of mentioned this is that oh yeah there it is at the bottom that there are certain physical therapists that are more comfortable doing internal exams and doing internal exercises and then there are other physical therapists that are less um, interested or less skilled in doing that and so it's helpful if you live outside of the city or if you're in a place where you might not know where there is a physical therapist that focuses on pelvic floor, you can check the, the PT locator and that'll help you as well to find someone. But it's usually covered and it's usually covered for a certain amount of time, so a certain number of visits. And if you need more visits than that, sometimes what'll happen is they'll send the patient back to the, the physician. We reevaluate and we say, yes, this patient needs to continue with physical therapy and we can resend a referral. Yes. Repeat the question. Uh, the question was about the home uh, biofeedback unit with the attached to the smartphone, and is that something, uh, or how do people acquire that? Um, so it's not something I think that's actually covered by insurance, is my understanding. Um, they have, there's a range of those home biofeedback units. So they have simple ones that cost probably between $40 and $50, very simple. Um, and then the one Nikita showed is, um, it's called the K-Goal. Um, it was actually developed by a, a pelvic physical therapist, Liz Miracle, and that one runs probably about $200 or $150. Is that 150? Yeah, 150. Um, so there is an expense to it, um, but the one, the K goal is certainly more, more sophisticated than the 40 to 50 dollar one. Um, so if uh, if patients are in, are interested in these uh, home units, we will uh, educate women about the different um, options that are available. But they don't need to be prescribed. You can get one. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, I think I, I generally understand the extensive evaluation that the physical therapist performs to be able to pinpoint and, uh, uh, where issues are and, and proper treatments. But with the OBGYN who diagnosed a prolapsed, uh, prolapsed organs, organ prolapse, you typically understand as much uh, of the problem as the, ultimately the physical therapist would understand. Mm -hmm. Um, so the question is that that um, it seems to that it, that it's easy to understand the detailed um, physical exams since they did such a great job describing it, and how often is it that the obstetrician gynecologist understands the details of the physical exam, and do they have the same depth of understanding of it? Does that sound about so? And I would say that there's a pretty wide range of. Um, experience with pelvic pain with OBGYNs. Some um, OBGYNs have, have learned about pelvic pain in their training, um, and some don't. Some have a passionate interest in it and learn about it later, um, and then can focus on that. And um, I do see patients sometimes who will say that they haven't had that type of exam prior to the visit with their gynecologist, and it may be that they just don't do the pelvic floor muscles as much. And I think that's just, and there's a range of people. So some patients, for me, for example, I will check the levators, but the physical therapist check the levator muscles in even greater detail than I do. Um, and sometimes I'll do additional exercises with their legs to see if they, the patient has more tension, but not everyone does that. And for their exam, they don't necessarily do that type of exercise. So I think that there's a variation of ways to assess and all of them are good and can be great to identify it. And even if um, I think the obstetrician gynecologist doesn't know exactly which muscles, knowing to send them to the physical therapist is one of the best things um, that they can do to start. Mm -hmm. I have a oh, yes. question. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm beginning to think that maybe the, uh, the use of a prescribed pessary in the long term might not be 
what's best for the patient if there are other physical therapy options that could um, literally take up the slack in the, in the, in the, in the uh, that might otherwise be supported by, in the public floor by a pessary. Uh, is that inc an incorrect uh, conclusion? Or? Do you want me to start? You can start. And we can yeah. Okay. Um, the question is with regards to pessaries. Are pessaries maybe um, something that doesn't necessarily need to be used, and there might be exercises or other physical therapy techniques that could be used in lieu of that, or maybe does the pessary even get in the way of being able to do those other techniques? And pessaries, um, like Nikita had mentioned, similar to a tampon in the vagina, they actually come in probably 30 different shapes and sizes. They can look like a cube, they can look like a donut, they can look like an old diaphragm with um, either open or closed. And so um, it's definitely not a one size fits all. It's very specific when you get sized for a pessary. Um, and pessaries can be used to either help with prolapse, so when the tissue kind of falls down or seems to be more relaxed. It also can be helpful for incontinence. So with stress urinary incontinence, sometimes a pessary will help prevent like the bridge analogy. It helps hold the bridge up and reduce the hypermobility of the urethra. Um, so from that perspective, I think that it can work for those things. Some people like pessaries, some people don't, but I think that they're great when they're used in conjunction with the exercises because the tissue will change and over time, maybe one pessary won't work as well as another, or maybe the muscles become relaxed and strong enough and well enough controlled that they won't need a pessary at all. The other thing that can help with that is weight loss too. So all of those things, because all of that pressure um, can also cause a little bit of relaxation. And then um, going back to what Nikita had mentioned about exercise. So, you know, there are some patients that when, when we talk to them, they, you know, they work in a situation where they do a lot of heavy lifting all day. And so when we think about, for example, surgeries and things like that, surgeries are a little bit less successful if somebody's going back to doing a job that has a lot of heavy lifting because they're putting so much more pressure on their pelvis and all of that intra-abdominal pressure can affect the pelvic floor. So, but I think it's the, it's the com combination together. Yeah, I would agree. We see a lot of patients who have a pessary, but they're coming to physical therapy to see if they can augment with the exercise. I'm working with a woman right now in her 70s. She's worn a pessary for over 10 years, and she wants to augment her muscles. When she has the pessary out for 24 hours to let her skin rest, she immediately feels the pressure um, symptoms, and so she wants to augment her muscles. And we also will train uh, women on education as far as avoiding bearing down, so toileting, positioning, um, the, avoiding heavy lifting, that sort of thing. So there's an education piece too. Yeah, the, the question is regards to um, a certain type of laser treatment that the gynecologist that she sees uses, and it's over the course of three treatments, and um, the issue with it is it's not covered by insurance, so is there anything on the horizon with regards to that? And I think that's, you know, that's a challenge with new devices and insurance and research showing the efficacy of it. So I think that um, sometimes when new devices come out, whether they work or not, and they seem to be working really well, the insurance companies need to see proof that they work. And devices come onto the market sometimes without as much research. It's, the devices are a little bit different than drugs, for example. Drugs go through a, a more rigorous testing before they get released onto the market. Devices can pass through very various ways to, be, to come onto the market. And so, I think until the time that they get more evidence about it and they can show that, then sometimes the insurance companies will start to cover things. But I'm not sure where that specific device stands and with regards to insurance. Thank you all so much. We'll, we'll be up at the front, so thank you. Thank you.